Okay, good morning, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Catherine Dougal, and I'm the Development and Engagement Specialist here at Bridge Michigan. Today, we'll be discussing how we navigate COVID moving forward. And this event is a part of Bridge Michigan's monthly lunch break series, where we discuss important issues to Michigan residents. If you aren't familiar with Bridge, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization serving the entire state of Michigan. And you can read our coverage for free every day online at bridgemi.com. I want to thank our Bridge members who are with us today and who help support our work. If you are not already a member and would like to become one, you can do so anytime on our website. And my colleague Josiah is also going to drop a link into the chat. The schedule for today's discussion is that we'll begin with the conversation between Bridge Michigan reporters Robin Herb and Mike Wilkinson and our two special guests, Dr. Matthew Sims and Dr. Mark Hamed. We'll then open the discussion to reader questions for our panelists. Throughout the discussion, you can enter your questions into the chat window at any time. If you are calling in today, you can email your questions to us at membership at bridgemi.com. Just so you know, we are recording this discussion and we'll be posting the recording on Bridge Michigan's website either later today or tomorrow. Now to uh, kick us off and get this conversation started, I know we had a lot of reader questions. I'm going to pass it off to my colleagues, Bridge reporters, Robin Erb and Mike Wilkinson. Uh, good afternoon. afternoon. My, name's Mike. My, my name is Mike Wilkinson and I have, if you're a, a, a frequent Bridge reader, um, the uh, COVID dashboard and tracker that we do is kind of my handiwork and I've been immersed in, in, in the daily numbers for a long time. I've talked to both, both doctors here uh, numerous times for stories. And I just want to kind of lay the, the little bit of a foundation of where we are. Uh, the state recently, just early in April, went to just reporting the numbers once a week. Um, so we don't have as great a picture as we used to have in terms of um, uh, in immediacy in terms of where we are. But um, we're at a real low point overall in terms of cases compared to Omicron. Uh, which peaked in uh, mid-January. We were seeing 17,000 cases a day. Um, currently, we're averaging about 1,200 a day, but they are rising. Um, two weeks ago, they went up 36%. Last week, they went up, I think, another 30. Uh, and we are seeing an increase in hospitalizations, uh, mainly in the area where Dr. Sims lives, um, or where he works. Uh, unfortunately, that, that is seeing some increases. Still, uh, it's uh, far fewer than what were there in January, mid, early January, there were over 5,000 in statewide. Now there's a little over 600. So uh, is that as a kind of the table setter? I wanted to start with the, the two doctors, if they could tell us a little bit about what they are seeing right now um, from um, Oakland County, I think is that where Dr. Sims is. And, and uh, well, I, I think Dr. Hamed is in many places, but uh, uh, from the thumb to the Lake Huron shore. But if uh, each of you can just take a couple minutes to tell us what you are seeing now and, and maybe contrast and, and compare that to what we have seen uh, previously. Um, sure, well, since you mentioned that it's, you know, really hitting our area a little more, um, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, things are definitely better than they were. <clears throat> In late December, early January, we were really at that peak of Omicron and we were hitting numbers that were getting close to you know, what we were hitting in the beginning of the pandemic when 80% of the cases were focused in, you know, the tri-county area of Michigan. Um, the numbers were, were pretty high and we had, you know, it, at Beaumont where I am, we had, you know, um, as the pandemic evolved, we opened COVID units where entire wings of floors or floors were dedicated to nothing but COVID patients. Um, and, uh, you know, over time, as the, the numbers went down, we kind of closed those. And back in December and January, we had to open them all up again. Um, in fact, it had to open even more up. Uh, but now, um, you know, there's really only one left. Um, uh, there are, you know, certain floors that certainly can handle COVID patients, but um, the numbers are way down. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, they've really uh, gotten to the point where, you know, we, we talk about uh, now, you know, system-wide, I think we have less than 100 patients um, or right around 100 patients now. Um, but we talk about those who are admitted for COVID, meaning they're coming in with respiratory issues, having trouble breathing, needing oxygen. 
Um, and those who were admitted with COVID, they're coming in for some other reason. They had a heart attack or they were in a car accident or they're coming in for surgery and they have, we test everybody because we need to make sure that it doesn't spread within the hospital. Um, and we happen to find some people who have COVID. Um, and in fact, in the last, uh, uh, last day that I saw patients, you know, I think I saw three patients uh, who were in COVID isolation. One was an older case. Um, and of the two who were new admissions, one came in with sort of mild COVID and other things, and the other came in for some other reason completely and happened to have COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, so we see a fair amount of that now where even though we have COVID cases, a lot of them are really, you know, in isolation to protect everybody around them rather than because they're really sick with COVID. I've been our uh, rural emergency department, Sandusky, Michigan, and the Thumb. Um, this time last year, we were um, two of my counties were the highest uh, COVID case rate counties in the country. Um, what a year a difference makes, honestly. But compare this to even two months ago, we had, you know, back in February, we had 30, 40% of our patients at the emergency department had COVID. And, and as, um, as you mentioned, Beaumont was taking all those patients, but we had a standstill of where we could transfer patients out to. We had to provide you know, intensive care in a non-intensive care unit in a hospital. So right now, though, however, um, maybe a handful of cases per day, and they're all very mild, um, thankfully. So um, we have a heightened sense of awareness now about COVID and, and about reinfection too. So people who historically thought, you know, you get COVID once, you can't get it again. We're seeing more reinfection now, so they do know that you know if you have symptoms and you have COVID, you might have it again. So come get tested. So we're seeing more people present for testing too, which is nice. What the reason I loved having the two of you here today, um, and I think any reader here, anybody who reads Health Watch closely, um, you know, is very maybe really familiar with with your face. I mean. The two of you have been at the front lines of COVID for more than two years now. Um, but I, I, I wanted to hear from you too, because you're both parents. And so, you know, we, we know what the data is telling us. We know what you're seeing now in the hospitals. But so much of why I think a lot of people here are here today is to understand how do we figure out what to do moving forward? You know, we're not in a surge. We don't know what's going to happen. But we have so many questions from readers about decisions that you know affect everyday life. So one of the biggest, of course, is about masking. And um, just you know, Dr. Sims, you and I talked about this um, because you did some some work that was published on masking early in the pandemic. So let's start with you. Tell us about what we're supposed to be doing with masking right now. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a difficult question, and, and people are hearing so many opinions, and you know. They know that uh, the CDC said, okay, you can take masks off, but they wanted to keep them in planes. And then this judge in Florida said, nope. And, and suddenly a judge gets to overrule the CDC's thoughts on the pandemic. And then from my understanding, the, the White House is appealing that. Um, and I think more to basically say, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't, the CDC's job is to help the country deal with pandemics and huge medical crises. And when you stop things like that, you know, on, the, on a judge's decision, rather than the decisions of the people whose job it is to do that, who are based on science, you get into politics over science and you get into, you're, you're negating the CDC's ability. But all that aside, um, you know, so there's nowhere really other than hospital systems generally that are requiring masks right now. There may be some individual, um, you know, employers or individual places that are doing it, but generally there, uh, and the city of Philadelphia put it back in actually um, recently, and a couple of universities put it back in, but most places they don't have uh, masking requirements um, outside of healthcare. Um, and as I said before, part of the reason we do that in healthcare is because we can't allow COVID to spread through the hospital, the sickest of the patients who are the most vulnerable. Right. Um, but people don't know what to do because they, they hear different things. So I agree with you, it's a confusing time for people, but I'll tell people what I do. Um, you know, one of the things that, they, that has been said is, you know, you have to kind of make the decision for yourself, but not everybody knows how to do that. But 
what I do is, you know, when I go into a place that's crowded, I wear a mask, right? Because I don't know who around me might be carrying it. And, you know, even if I'm, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, I'm about to get my second booster. Um, and uh, despite that, I know I'm vulnerable. I'm over 50 and, you know, I'm carrying a little too much weight and et cetera. So I'm in the, that, you know, somewhat vulnerable group, not the worst of the vulnerability. And I know that if I get it and it really knocks me out, that's going to impact my ability to help patients. Um, and I don't want that to happen. So I take a lot of caution. Now, that being said, if my kids bring it home and expose me, you know, <laughs> um, I know more people who are getting it just through exposures in their family than they are at work or et cetera. Um, and that, that makes things difficult. But if I go into a crowd, I wear a mask. And I've shifted recently to more likely wearing um, KF94s or KN95s uh, over surgical masks. And the reason is because we know those protect the people who are wearing it. In fact, you mentioned my research and that's one of the things we saw that while surgical masks protected people, um, KN95s or N95s protected people more. Um, and even if you broke through when you were wearing one of those, you were more likely to be asymptomatic. And that's because you know if it broke through, it was probably a very small amount of virus. Um, so, Surgical masks work best when everybody's wearing it because they're really meant to prevent the person who's wearing the mask from spreading whatever they have, right? They're meant for the surgeon to wear to protect the person whose body they are, you know, performing surgery on. Um, they're not really meant to protect the person wearing it as much. So it really depends on everybody wearing it so nobody can spread it, right? But the KN95s and the N95s and the KF94s, those are a much, um, a denser weave, they're more designed to protect the person who's wearing it. So now when I go into a situation that I consider uh, more risky, I wear one of those. Um, you know, and when I flew, I, I wore N95s. And going forward, now that it's not, masking's not required on planes, I'll be wearing N95s anytime I fly. And I may even wear eye protection um, because you can get infected through your eyes if somebody breathes into your eyes or sneezes or coughs into your eyes. Um, so I may wear some eye protection as well. And so that know, one way masking. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That? Oh, I was going to say that glass, one way masking. Actually, yeah, right. So if, if my mask is all that's there to protect me, I have to wear a better kind of mask. So, so that's what I do. But when I'm just out walking around, you know, I don't wear a mask. Um, when I'm in a situation where I might end up in a crowd or, you know, directly face to face with multiple people. I, uh, you know, I will, uh, I'll mask up. Um, I saw somebody just put in the chat, what kind of eye protection. So I wear um, sort of safety glasses. So they're not, I, I, if I'm going into a COVID room, I wear goggles, like lab goggles, tight to the face. If I'm just walking around or whatnot, I usually wear safety glasses that um, sit against my face, but they're not held tight to the face. There have been studies that actually show even people who wear glasses have lower rates, but it's not as good as if you wore something that really completely covered your eyes. Regular glasses offer some of that protection? They offer a little bit of protection. There have been studies that have shown that. Yeah, you mentioned the boosters. Um, if I could jump right into the second question. Um, it, we've heard a lot about these second boosters. I'm one of that over 50 crowd. There just seems to be such personal calculus in that too. Um, tell us a little bit, and, and maybe Dr. Hamid, you could talk a little bit about this, um, about the immunity boost that you get from it, about how long it's there and talk about timing for, for getting a second booster. Should we? Yeah, you know, the data from Israel, which was the first country to get that second booster showed that um, <clears throat> your rate of severe COVID decreased by three times the level of severity as compared to those who only got one booster. The kicker is the um, maximum protective effectiveness was probably at four weeks and it starts to diminish after that towards about eight weeks too. But again, that is a controlled um, level of immunity you have rather than risking it through exposure, contracting COVID, you have a controlled way of getting some immunity. So in my opinion, I highly recommend the second booster for those who are qualified for it. So. 
because the benefit does outweigh the risk in those individuals. On that point, you mean, because we're almost on the summer and, and cases have typically been down in the summer. We're outside more often. The weather is warmer. That seemed has been a role. Uh, you know, so it's almost May. Basically, well, heck, it's uh, 30 some degrees now. But um, some people seem to be waiting because they like what Robin was saying. And you mentioned that, that they want to start that four weeks after the sustained decline in cases. Is there, um, you know, is that a calculus at all for people? You know, people have taken that into consideration. Some of my partners have certainly taken that into consideration as they make recommendations to say, you know, maybe don't get it now, get it closer to the flu season. Um, you know, we don't know all those answers, right? They are very, um, these are very detailed, uh, difficult questions to know. And, you know, if you get it now, if they start recommending another one in six months, well, you know, that's right around the you know, flu season. So, uh, we don't know what's going to end up in another six months, but um, what I'm hoping will happen is that we'll actually come out with an Omicron-specific vaccine. There are two, at least in development, from Pfizer and from Moderna. Um, and, you know, a paper came out that, that people have interpreted badly that said, oh, it didn't really do all that much. And, and it, they interpreted it wrong, right? It talked about how well it boosted the existing, you know, immunity rather than looking at giving a full, you know, two shots of it, does it give you better immunity to Omicron, right? Which is what they should have done. Um, and, and this is the difficulty when, you know, a paper comes out and people misinterpret it and it gets into social media or it gets to the media or it gets wherever. Um, and it said it right in that paper that, you know, they, this is what they looked at, but they probably need to look at this. Um, but the reason that I'm, I'm hoping for the Omicron specific vaccine to come out in part is a give us you know we get diminishing returns from boosting it can only get you so far if only 10 percent of the antibodies you make from that vaccine work against that virus you can only get your immunity so high if you now shift to a vaccine that gives you a 90 percent match or 100 percent match you're going to get more antibodies that actually neutralize and you're going to get better protection which will last longer because as it drops, they're still, all of them are still working. So that's one reason. The second reason is, is what we saw when the first vaccine went in, right? The first vaccine was made to the wild type virus, right? Nobody in the, very few people in the US got the wild type virus, right? We were already into alpha by the time vaccines were around. And since alpha was fairly close to wild type, it had changed off wild type, we still got full protection from that vaccine because it only was a small mismatch, right? Whereas then we went to you know Delta and then Omicron and every step of the way, we got more mutations, we got further away from that wild type. So now if we give people an Omicron vaccine, whatever the next variant that comes out will almost certainly come from Omicron. So hopefully just like with the wild type and alpha, whatever the next variant is, if you vaccinate against Omicron, you'll still get good immunity um, to that. The wild type, you're talking about the very first version. The very first one out of China. Yeah. Okay. The original, okay. the original strain, no mutations. That's what the vaccine was developed against. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of variables, a lot of uncertainties in front then, definitely. Could you talk either one of you a little bit about, you know, just the Omicron, the, the BA2 variant now, what else we may be seeing? And I guess I'm looking for a little more, a, a little insight to how worried we should be about what's coming down the pike. And, yeah, you know, and I, I should, I, I just want to push this out there. One of the reasons I've appreciated talking to both of you over the last couple of years is, you know, we've talked a lot about not panicking and not being fearful all the time, just straightforward information and making, you know, making, making decisions based on that. So just in real terms, what are we yeah, talking so, about looking forward? So, you know, and I'll be interested to hear what Dr. Hamid has to say as well. Uh, but just briefly, uh, we don't know what the next thing is gonna be, right? When Delta was out, it was so much more contagious than Alpha before it that we were like, wow, you know, 
what, what, you know, we're so much more contagious. What's going to replace this? Nothing, you know, how much more contagious could it get? And then all of a sudden we got Omicron that was like four times more contagious. Omicron's as contagious as measles, which is one of the most contagious infectious diseases out there, right? And then BA2 is actually even more contagious than the original Omicron. So, you know, we don't know what the limits of its contagiousness can be. You know, mutations can change that make it last, stay around longer. Um, and the big concern is, will we get, you know, keep the mutations that make it very contagious and then pick up mutations that make people sicker or make the antibodies not work? Um, those, that's the big concern. And, you know, not, I don't want to be a doomsayer. I don't want to be fear inducing. But, you know, that, those are the things that we worry about. And that's why it's so important to be able to shift the vaccine as we need to. And the hope is because these, these um, mRNA vaccines can be made so quickly that we get to the point where, like we are with flu right now, we don't run a big new clinical trial every year when we change the flu vaccine because we know how to make a flu vaccine. We know they work. We know they're safe. We need to get to that point with the mRNA vaccines for COVID so that when a new, vac when a new variant comes out, they can change it and two months later start giving it rather than have to recruit. 10,000 people into a study. That's where we need to get. We're not there yet. Dr. Hamid. Yes, you mentioned a good point. So I'd, I'd, I'd rather have a more contagious variant than a, <clears throat> one that causes more severe Ill, uh, illness. And that's what we're seeing with, um, with Omicron is a, a much less severe, you know, overall much less severe illness with this current variant. Um, but that's the kicker is, you know, we're seeing this more contagious variant um, that's causing one of our go-to medical antibodies to be no longer effective. Sochimavad is no longer effective against B2 variant. So it's been pulled from the market. So that brings up a question is, are we gonna to have to modify our, not only our vaccines, but our medical antibodies over time too, to adjust these variants as well? And we run out of options. Um, that's, that's a question I, you know, I, I think about all the time. Um, and again, I mean, I, I'd rather have a much more contagious uh, variant that doesn't cause severe illness. Um, and that to me would be more of a truly endemic, heading towards endemic uh, stage. But like you said, it's, it's still kind of early um, to call it. So. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that would really, really help for people was, you know, so you mentioned um, the personal calculation we all have to make, right? I mean, do we want a one way mask and protect ourselves? And um, we're all trying to decide when we go to the grocery store or we go to the restaurant. Um, so I wondered if you could just, both of you could kind of help us help people understand, you know, what's the difference indoors, outdoors, big crowd, small crowd, like, you know, family reunions are coming up. Should people, what would you do in a family reunion? There's a summer fair, you know, the county fair, you know, and Gaylord is going, I think it's Gaylord is going on, um, you know, a concert indoor versus outdoor church services. Should we, you know, share, you know, shake hands and share the communion cup. If you can kind of walk through some of those things, those real world things, and maybe how I, either of you or both, I mean, both of you are, are, are dealing with those because I think that's, a, you know, we can talk about variant names and, and that, but I think people want to know, you know, should I go to the grocery store? Should I go to Kroger and what I should do? So I wonder if you could kind of walk through some of those different scenarios, what you think would be best for people. Dr. Hamid, why don't you start? <laughs> sure, you know, that's a good point. So um, I look at the, what's going on in the community. So if you're in a high-risk community, you're a community of, uh, Increase the amount of cases, and you're, like you're a high-risk individual, um, anything outdoor would be safer. You have know, like better ventilation, uh, more space between other uh, people. Um, but when you're indoors, definitely wear a mask. So I, I wouldn't not go shopping. I would not not go get my groceries. I just uh, be mindful of what's going on in the community. Um, if you have any concerns, wear a mask, distance yourself, like we've been doing. I mean, um, I guess all those measures do work. Shake hands wash your hands, don't touch your face, things that we learned in the pandemic, things that we learned in third grade that we forgot for how many decades that we're starting to do again, but those work to help prevent transmission. So I think those lessons learned during the pandemic, um, you know, they, they are effective. They, they do work, hand sanitizers, these are effective as well. So I think we're in a much better place now than we were a year ago, two years ago. Um, and we should keep moving forward. So by all means, attend that concert, if it's outdoor, even better. If it's indoor, as Esther, like as Esther since mentioned, you might want to consider wearing a mask if you're going to be close together with people of unknown vaccine status. Um, and if you're sick, stay home. 
that's a simple thing that's hard to do sometimes if you're sick stay home and that's why we're seeing you know there's less uh, influenza less other contagious diseases being spread so i mean these these simple measures are working and um you know we should definitely move forward and you know but be mindful of what's going on in the community and across the world too honestly you know the best way i can answer this is i can give you some examples from my own life right so go back six months ago and I was still not, not going to restaurants, not going, you know, only going out when I needed to go out. Um, we hadn't taken a vacation in, you know, other than like a, a weekend where we might rent a house somewhere and, you know, basically stay in that house <laughs> for, uh, for two plus years. Um, now, since then, you know, as the cases came down and some of this was planned before Omicron and kind of overlapped Omicron. So, um, you know, I, we've taken vacations now, right? After three years of no vacations, we, we went to Hawaii and we flew and we took our caution flying, right? So we wore N95s, me, my whole family, everybody was vaccinated. Hawaii had some really good policies in place because they realize how dangerous it is if COVID gets loose there. They have a very, their whole healthcare system is about the size of Beaumont Health, um, including the number of ICU beds. And that's for their whole state. Um, now it's a small state, but, and they're also thousands of miles away from any kind of relief. Um, and they have a population that's multi-generational in, you know, the same house. So they realize how bad COVID could be if it really got loose there. So they mandated that everybody who came to the island had to either have a negative test within 72 hours of setting foot on the island or be vaccinated and show proof, have uploaded proof of that you had the full vaccine series finished by two weeks before. Um, so luckily for my youngest daughter, she just got eligible and managed to do it right before. Um, and then anywhere you went, if you wanted to walk into a restaurant or a movie theater or you know um, some kind of a, you know a, a sightseeing thing, you had to show proof of vaccination. You had to carry, I carried my cards with me, you know, to say, look, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, my daughter's vaccinated. Um, it was great. I felt very safe there. Um, now came back, you know, and, and it, things are different. Uh, but, um, you know, we've, I've been, I've been to a few restaurants. We try to go off hours so that it's not busy and sit away from people. Um, we wear the masks when we're not eating. Um, you know, we do things cautiously to try to get back to a more normal life. We, I went to Disney World with my family. And, um, you know, I, because Disney World is what it is, and there are crowds everywhere and whatnot, even outdoors, I mostly wore a mask. Uh, because you never knew when you were going to be shifted into a crowd, right? Um, but, you know, it was warm. And there were times where I'm like, when there's nobody around, I'll take the mask down, breathe it for a little while, and put it back on. Um, so, and you know, I didn't get sick going to Disney World, others didn't get sick. The key is to play things safe when it's appropriate to play things safe. You can live a pretty normal life like we were before the pandemic, not exactly like we were, with taking a little bit of caution, washing hands, et cetera. Now, you know, I can tell you when um, we had a family reunion, this was actually before Omicron, it was probably still during Delta, we went to visit. Uh, my in-laws and uh, you know they're older and they were back fully vaccinated we were all fully vaccinated except for my youngest who was you know not eligible yet and uh, but we all wore masks when we were with each other when we ate we ate outside um, one thing I do want to stress always remember outdoors is safer don't make the mistake of thinking it's safe right like I said when I was at Disney I wore a mask all the time because you never knew when you were going to get jostled in the crowd. I have a friend who got in, probably got infected with COVID at uh, the Michigan Michigan State football game. Outdoors, when when they were indoors in the arena, you know, walking through and whatnot, they had to wear masks. But outdoors, they could take it off. But they were in a huge crowd of people, right? So even though it was outdoors, you're pressed against a huge crowd of people. It's still and you're you're sitting there for quite a while. It's still taking a risk, right? So. Outdoors is safer, but I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent safe. Don't think it's a magic shield that's going to protect you just because you do things outdoors. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question of uh, Dr. Hamad, who uh, 
Tom Ahmed, uh, that uh, one of the readers, uh, Victor, suggested, which was going to be one of our questions as well. You said when you're making the calculus, you, you got to kind of know what the situation is where you are. Um, and right now, with the state only giving out the numbers once a week, um, I mean, I can go, I mean, I have the ability to get the CDC numbers on testing and hospitalizations. It, it's not an easy thing to do to kind of make that determination. The CDC is only giving its community levels out once a week. How do you know what's going on, especially, you know, two weeks in a row, we've had a 30% increase. Um, how do you determine what the situation is where you are? Really, it's going to be about, um, it'll be about being proactive, you know, going online, looking that data up. You know, it's it's um it's a little tedious at times. You know, like where to navigate to find the right data, and then as somebody mentioned too, so we have a lot more home tests right now too. People are testing, probably negative and positive, but at least they're testing, right? So we would assume that you get a positive test, you're proactive, and you stay home, you write out COVID, you get treatment. So I don't know how much the numbers are being skewed and what the true percent positivity rate is in the community, but, but um like I think a good rule of thumb would be. You have to look up the CDC website, look up the NDHS website to see what your what county levels are. Um, just to tack on to the family reunion concept. We had ours last month and we had 80 people to get together from different states. We planned it out a month in advance. Hey guys, get your free COVID test. Test a day before you guys show up. If you're sick, stay home. If you're not vaccinated, you have time to get vaccinated. So we really put out there to the family members and, and we even put out there too, if you wanna wear a mask, we encourage it. If you don't want to, we're not going to judge you. But around these high-risk individuals, you might want to consider it. You know, um, and it was a it was a hit. We all tested. We all were negative. We all tested a week after the reunion too. All negative as well. So really, I think I think that kind of planning and being proactive, and using these tests that are available now, which we didn't have, you know, as widely available months ago. Get your free test every month from your insurance company if you're eligible. Um, but by all means, um, look at your risk levels. Look at community levels and. You know, for me, I just recommend people go on the website, watch the daily news for cases. The reporting once a week, I, I, yeah, it's, it's not as accurate as it was every, you know, two, three times a week, but at least the reporting once a week. I mean, that's better than nothing at this point, which we'll take. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that just that, you know, because the numbers are so low with the official testing, as, as you said, we don't know what they are in reality because people, so many people are either mild or asymptomatic and they're not getting tested at all or they're getting a home test and we never see those positives, right? Um, but so because the numbers are so small, putting it out every day, you're gonna see little blips and fluctuations on a daily basis that are for the most part meaningless, right? When the numbers are so small, putting it out too frequently doesn't actually tell you very much, right? If you see a huge spike one day, it probably means there was a super spreader event somewhere. <laughs> Um, but outside of that, um, weekly right now, because of the overall numbers, it's probably reasonable. But, you know, a lot of, I know Beaumont, we put out our numbers on a website, right? So, you know, on a daily basis, you know how many people are admitted to our hospital with COVID. Um, I'm sure some of the other uh, healthcare systems are doing the same thing. So you can look at the healthcare system in your backyard, see if they have it on their website. And that will at least tell you hospitalizations. And if you see that going up on a daily basis, that's more concerning, to be honest, than the actual positivity. Because as you know, Dr. Hamed said, as I said, as I think multiple people on this call have said, um, more contagious but less sick is probably better. Um, so if people are staying out of the hospital, that's what you really, really want to see ask two more questions before we get to the reader questions. Um, but before I get there, just very briefly, one reader um, or one reader asked this question very briefly. What about communion cups at church? I know that's a big deal for a lot of folks. Share communion cups. Uh, I, I personally would suggest avoiding that. It's just, that's a risk you can't control. Interesting. Let me move on before, again, before we get to the reader questions. Um, I had a situation this week where somebody was super sick from COVID, tested positive, incredibly sick. Six days later, I happened to be talking to them. They had no idea there, there were therapies available for COVID. They never called their doctor, which makes me realize no matter how much we write about them and how much you talk about them, people still don't know. Can you give us a very quick up, update if you get sick? What do you do? What's available? Yeah. Just briefly. Call your doctor. Do one of you. 
So call your doctor, get formally tested, not just, you know, if you're really sick, get formally tested. And there are options, right? There are at least three medications right now that you can get while you're outpatient to try to make you better, right? Um, uh, number one, probably the most recommended one is Paxlovid, um, which has a big long name, nilmetrinavir, ritonavir, something like that. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing it. Uh, that's why I say Paxlovid. I, uh, I try not to use brand names, but that one's just tough. Um, that's got, a, you know, the studies show that if you start that within about five days of getting symptoms, you've got about a 90% decrease in hospitalization. Um, then there's malnuprinavir. Um, that one's not quite as good with the numbers, but still well worth it. And there are some medications, that, there are some things that Paxlovid has interactions. Um, so if you're on certain medications, you may not be able to take it. So malnuprinavir is another option. And then lastly, there's still one monoclonal antibody that works. It's Bebtalebumab, I think is the name of it. Again, I'm probably horribly mispronouncing it. Um, that one still works on BA2. Um, and that may be available at different places. Um, you know, we have it at Beaumont. I know that different places have it. Um, but I, that, those are the, the order I would start in. And then, of course, we still have uh, remdesivir for the people who are in the hospital. The reason that's not used outpatient very much is it's IV only. Um, though there's, there was a study that showed giving three days of it um, was about as just as effective as Paxlovid at keeping people out of the hospital. So there are options, there are good options. And for people who really have a risk, they should be on it. And I get calls all the time. I just tested positive for COVID. What do I do? Like Paxlovid. Or Dr. You know, I say, Dr. Hamid, you've been with the Michigan Association of Family Physicians for so long. And you know, we're we're talking about we're talking about you know, two doctors who are in the hospitals too, but from I mean, do I call my family doctor? Any uh, prescribing provider can write for it. So Okay. Yes, yeah, so the key is honestly, as Dr. Sims mentioned, the time period of five days, that's your magic number. Beyond five days, the benefits aren't proven. But your magic number is five days of when symptoms start, you want to get tested. There's actually pharmacies now in Michigan that actually will treat and test, well, test and treat on the spot too. So some Meyer pharmacies, I'm, I'm not sure the other pharmacies, but they'll test you for COVID there in the pharmacy. If you test positive, they can prescribe the medication there on the spot. So this, it's called the test and treat um, concept. And, and I think it's becoming more and more popular now. And the magic just number is five days. Yeah, and, and just to add, you know, in the beginning when these drugs first became available, they were really hard to find, really hard to get. There were very limited amounts. Um, and there were all these restrictions on using it. You had to fill out this big form and all the test a bunch of things. Um, that has slowly dropped off. It's much easier to prescribe, much easier to use. It's in most pharmacies now, or I don't know about most, but many, many more pharmacies. Um, and we have a surplus in the state, to be honest now. Um, so it's not like it's all getting used up. There's a surplus. So if you've got COVID and you're, at, you're in one of those high risk groups, you should be getting treatment. Be clear, the pharmacy not only can test you, they can prescribe it and they can give it to you, give you the, the treatment there. You don't need to go to your doctor? You know, I think those are, tend to be the pharmacies that are, like, are associated with like uh, you know, an urgent care is where there's okay. somebody there who can actually prescribe. Because remember, pharmacists right. can't prescribe. So there has to be a doctor, an NP, or somebody who's associated with it, unless they have some sort of a, um, a prescription by policy, which is set up with a doctor and whatnot. And they say, if okay. this happens, this is prescribed. Usually those are only done through hospitals, but they may have it set up for pharmacy. I'm, I'm actually not as familiar with that. When well, Dr. Hamid just put a, uh, a link in the chat there, um, the test to treat website. So that's helpful. Great. I had a question, that's a great strategy. I had a question on the PAX a little bit. I, I have read the stories that there is a surplus. Is that because doctors are, I mean, are not prescribing it or is there a hesitancy in using that just like there has been for some people with the vaccine? A little A and a little B. <laughs> I think the cases are a little bit like, like more... Uh, milder now, I think because there are milder cases now, there's less of an urgency to go run and get medication because you know, um, the severity of the illness is just so mild at this point. So that might be one more reason why we're not seeing uptake of the Paxlovid at this point. 
but there's a surplus on the medication. There's a surplus. So if you got COVID, get it. And it, it, again, the people who really need it are the ones who are at highest risk for some, for bad COVID outcomes, right? So bad hypertension, obesity, older, immunosuppressed, you know, there's a whole laundry list. And those are the people who really need it. If you're 30 and healthy and you got happen to get COVID, you know, less, less important, doesn't mean it's not going to potentially be a benefit because I've seen plenty of really sick 30, healthy 30 year olds with COVID. Um, so, um, you know, you have to take all of that into consideration. I think we can turn to some reader questions. Um, and one that comes up a lot, and it was asked again today, is about long COVID. Um, you know, I think everybody thinks about COVID first as in that immediate sickness, but what are we seeing in terms of long COVID? I've seen numbers all over the place and how many people really do have that. And um, let's talk about the booster too. Um, with, with long COVID, should, should folks with long COVID get the booster? So what are we seeing? And should people long COVID get a booster? Who wants to take that? Do you want to start, Dr. Hamid, or you want me to start? I'll just talk about long COVID. Um, some studies say up to 30% of people who've had COVID are developing long COVID, which is symptoms that could last up to longer than three months. Um, some will be like alopecia, some will be shortness of breath, headaches, fatigue. Um, so these are people who, who can be generally pretty sick for a while after they have had COVID had COVID recovered, but developed lingering symptoms or had COVID and just lingering symptoms since COVID. And I definitely recommend they do get their booster. I, you know, I, I think they do want to get protection against getting COVID again. Um, you know, it's uh, something that we're still learning more and more about. Definitely, um, it's, it's going to account for a lot of uh, outpatient visits and uh, specialty visits in the next few months to years, I'm sure. I can imagine that's going to be a big cost and complication for the healthcare system with so many people having some of the serious long COVID. Yeah, and, and there's some other issues with that. You know, nobody, there's no specialty that owns long COVID, so to speak, right? You know, so there are some hospital systems like I know U of M has set up a long COVID clinic. Um, and I, I think I'm not sure who's staffing it, but, you know, I know some pulmonologists who do stuff with long COVID and some ID doctors, and I know some pain medicine doctors who do, some rehab doctors. The thing is long COVID's got so many different manifestations. Um, you know, there are a number of infectious diseases um, that have some post-infectious complications, right? And long COVID is really a post-infectious complication. It's not that they still are infected. It, it's how their body reacted to it, how their immune system reacted to it. Um, some of it is, is difficult to deal with, but understandable, right? They had such a bad case of COVID that they scarred their lungs. So they're short of breath all the time now, or they, their, their heart was affected and now their heart muscle is weak. Those are easy to understand, hard to necessarily treat, right? The ones that are harder to understand are the people who just have terrible fatigue, or generalized pain, or can't remember anything. You know, their, their, their memories like Swiss cheese. Um, those are much diff more difficult to understand, but we see other, there are other conditions out there that are similar that we deal with all the time. And I think that as we learn more, because this is such a big issue, such a prevalent issue, you know, there's a lot of money being thrown behind research into long COVID now. And I think that things we learn about long COVID are actually going to benefit us about learning about other pain syndromes and memory issues, and et cetera, as we go forward. But it's going to take a long time. It's not simple. I wanted to add, uh, we had a, a Yvonne Owens asked a question, which I think is a great one. I think uh, a lot of us heard I've heard Dr. Fauci for two years, and recently he had suggested that and we're past the pandemic phase, and I don't know if he used the word endemic. Um, you guys sound, sound cautiously optimistic, Dr. Ahmed. I, I do remember a year ago, I forgot that the, the thumb was just getting crushed uh, up there, Sinclair, Sanilac, uh, Tuscola. Um, are you both cautious? Are you ready to make that call that we're, we're moving to that phase? Um. You know, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I emphasize cautious. 
I don't think we're quite out of it yet, you know, as cases are going up again. I think that it's becoming more endemic in, in that it's milder, it's just sort of there in the background. And if it gets to be the kind of virus that really, you know, we just don't get people that sick from, well, that's except on rare cases, because then that would be great. Um, I think it might be a little early. I agree, you know, one of the things Dr. Fauci just said is he thinks we're in what we call the deceleration phase, where we're heading toward endemicity and really seeing sort of, you know, uh, an overall recovery. And I overall agree with that, but that can change in a minute if we get a bad variant. Um, so caution is, is certainly still warranted. I agree, caution and just being, uh, being careful moving forward, because I think it's still kind of early to call it endemic at this point. You know, and one thing I'll, I'll just briefly add, it's like, you know, it might be a milder illness now, et cetera. I still don't want to get it, right? I still want to do everything to not get infected by it because you know what? I don't want to take the risk of spreading it to other people. And I don't want to take the risk of developing long COVID and all those other things that may have nothing to do with how mild your particular case is. So. One of the readers asked, you know, did, did you see a bump from that? Did, you know, did that affect things? Um, and of course, with spring break, that means warmer weather afterwards, hopefully, too. So maybe that'll help. But care to comment on spring break? Not in the emergency department. I didn't see many positives come through through, through the ER. So that's, that's a good thing. But how many of them are taking a home test and positive? I don't know. But sick enough to come to the ER to be tested? Very few. Yeah. Uh, I agree. You know, I don't think we saw a particular bump. Like I said, we went to Disney for spring break, but we were cautious when we went to Disney, right? Now, 90% plus of the people we saw walking around were not wearing masks ever. What do you hard think about... Oh, oh, God. No, I just said hard to know what to make of that and what oh. happened to people. I'm sure there were cases that spread there. How many? Did any of them get that sick? We, there's just no way to know. What, what are your thoughts on groups? If somebody put in here, their symphony is continuing its policy of requiring masks. Because on one hand, I can see that people are just tired of wearing masks. So enforcing a policy like that is tough. On the other hand, folks who feel much better with masks, what do you think about mandating masks in places like that, like a symphony? You know, concert uh, hall. Yeah, um, I'm still a fan of mandating masks in really high risk areas, right? So if you guys remember way back to the beginning, there was a, 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 a case of um, a, core, a choir practice that this, it, hit, it hit the news where one person had COVID and spread it to like 81 of 83 people and there were a couple of deaths. Um, Remember when you sing, you know, you project it out and, you know, things travel further. Um, and and that's, that's, that's uh, a concern. Um, you know, symphony, again, if you're playing woodwinds and things where it may, you know, actually project um, your breath, um, it's probably not the worst idea in the world. So I'm still a fan of in, in high risk situations, big crowds indoors, potentially if things that can spread it there, it's probably still a good idea to wear masks. And, you know, I was in a meeting not that long ago where, you know, the masks were optional and there were, you know, probably about 15% of us in the room were wearing masks and uh, the rest of the people weren't. And that's just the way it was. Are we seeing, moving away from COVID just for a minute, but um, one of the readers asked about, um, you know, other viruses. Is there evidence that some of the other viruses are emerging kind of, you know, well, COVID, you know, we're trying to keep COVID at bay. Some of these other viruses are, are flourishing. Dr. Do you want to? Yeah, I don't, are you seeing, uh, what are we seeing, I guess, in, in other respiratory illnesses? You know, or, um, 
we're seeing, um, you know, when, when the ERA actually run a, a viral panel, respiratory panel, checking for 19, 20 viruses too. So we, so we are seeing some of the more traditional viruses for the season, the adenovirus, rhinovirus. Is it causing common cold? We are seeing more of those at this point. But a few, um, like a month and a half ago, we were seeing a lot of influenza A. So, and now we're seeing strep throat now. So, so we're seeing some, um, so we're seeing more seasonal, you know, traditional seasonal viruses that cause a common cold, runny nose, upper respiratory symptoms. So that's kind of refreshing in a way. We're not seeing any more major COVID cases, but we're still seeing these viruses out there. Yeah, I think overall we're seeing less of those viruses still. Uh, especially inf influenza started to come up and then just disappeared uh, much faster than it normally did. And the cases never hit. And, you know, a year ago, there were almost no cases. Um, I've only seen this whole season, maybe a couple of admitted patients with influenza, whereas normally I see, you know, a good number and usually some in the ICU and whatnot. Um, but I do remember that the second the mask mandate went away, we started to see an uptick in RSV cases right back in July and RSV is usually a, a winter virus. But for whatever reason, as soon as that mask mandate went away, we started to see an uptick in RSV. It wasn't just an, an uptick in some places in Michigan, we remember writing about it. There was just an explosion among some of the kiddos yeah. with RSV, yeah. Can we talk I a little? Wanna... Go ahead, Mike. Well, I, I just said, this is, you know, not, it's on the topic a little bit. I, I'm, I'm very curious, Dr. Hervet, in your experience, you know, we've been in this now for over two years. We've had the vaccine for almost a year and a, what is it, a year and four months. Um, have attitudes changed in terms of resistance to it? I mean, I know we have succeeded in some extent, to some extent, to beat down Omicron because we have natural immunity from so many people getting it and we have the vaccine, but in the vaccine part, have the attitudes at all changed? Are people coming around to, I know the numbers are low, but are they, are they changing at all that you're seeing? You know, we saw a change in behaviors around the time the Delta virus was really kind of hitting peak because we saw a lot more people getting more sick. We saw reinfections come up. And by that time, I kind of described it as being a movie that just came out. Whenever a movie comes out, people are gonna rush to go see. Whoever wants to see it's gonna watch it right away. Some will wait for the reviews. Some will watch it on video. Some just wanna watch it, period. Same with the vaccine, some are on the fence about it. Those who are on the fence are kind of waiting it out and are getting it now. So, you know, we're seeing some uptick in the vaccine, but um, still those who got the first, second doses are gonna get the booster. So um, I think depending on the severity of the illness, I mean, people who had COVID, they think they may have some immunity long-term. I think once you start seeing increased amounts of reinfections or severity of illness, we'll start seeing more people taking vaccines, but for now it's kind of been at a standstill for the most part. Yeah, there was a little bit of an uptick. I just, I saw some numbers and, and, but most of the vaccine, you know, a lot of vaccines got given out in the last few weeks, but they were almost all boosters. But there were, you know, 7,000 new first vaccines or something like that. I don't remember. Um, you know, we're in Michigan, we're a little behind the national average in, in the percent of our state that's vaccinated. Um, but between vaccines and boosters and natural infection, we're probably a, a large part of our state is covered, right? And, uh, you know, there was, uh, the last estimate I saw was that 35% of the state had, had been, oh, 25 or 35% of the state had had a natural infection. Um, but, and then I more recently saw a quote that said, they, they, they estimated that 60% of the population of the U.S. had a natural infection. And I'm not really sure where that came from. <laughs> um, that seems a little high, but 25%, I wouldn't doubt it at all. I mean, the confirmed PCR cases in Michigan would get you there. And obviously there's so many people who have had it that didn't know they had it or they got a home test. So I, I yeah. think that number is pretty high. Yeah, but 60% seems a little high. I think it's probably more than 25, but how much more? Harder to know. You know, so you I, have I wouldn't, to tell you, I wouldn't think it would be double. There's nothing better than I'm seeing myself up here in the corner on my screen. And after telling me not to touch my mouth, I'm constantly yeah. doing this. <laughs> yeah, um, before we close up, I want to ask you about the other. Uh, we get this a lot from readers. What part does good health otherwise 
play in the prevention of COVID. So we've talked about masking, we're talking about vaccines, we're talking about vac uh, boosters, but we also talk about chronic conditions and how they play into the worst outcomes. Talk about good health and COVID. I will tell you from a, a practicing ER physician standpoint, optimal health, you know, go into, if you're a healthy person, your odds of getting very sick with this is a lot less. And we're seeing it firsthand in the ER. So those with chronic conditions, respiratory illnesses too, um, those are the ones who are getting really sick and being hospitalized too. So, yeah, I mean, really your overall health um, plays a key role and it really does. Now, getting healthy while you have COVID, it's kind of hard to do because you because you might be really tired, fatigued, but definitely your pre-COVID health status is so important, it really mm -hmm. is. Yeah. I ask this, of course, as somebody who hasn't been to the gym for two months, but... And touching you know, your face, yeah, I know. Yeah, if you go to the, you know, going to the gym is okay, wear masks. You know, and I know that's a little harder to do when you're exercising, you might be a little short of breath and whatnot, but, um, you know, I still think that's the safest thing to do is wear masks when you're even there. Because again, especially since people may be huffing and puffing, they may be pu pushing out more COVID than normal. Great. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate you both being here. And I just, I, I'm looking at the clock and I wanna be, be conscious of everybody's time here. Um, and I, <laughs> yes, th thank you for the comment. Go walk outside. That's a great idea, especially, yeah. I don't know where it is or how it is where you all are today, but it is beautiful here. So I plan on doing that. Looks nice out. Good. <laughs> Catherine, did you want to um, make sure that everybody has the link and for, for the recording and whatnot? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Sims and Dr. Hamad. Um, this has been such an important and, and really um, insightful discussion today. I really appreciate all of you lending your expertise to our readers. As a reminder to everyone, the recording of this discussion will be posted on Bridge Michigan's website tomorrow at bridgemi.com. So please feel free to share the post with anyone who may have missed the discussion or if you'd like to rewatch it. If you want to stay up to date on upcoming Bridge Michigan events and our excellent reporting that Mike and Robin will do, you can subscribe to our free newsletter at bridgemi.com as well. And once again, thank you to our guest speakers today. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you all.